for painting. <laughs> Apologies. You got a clapper board. Should be done. You should be good to go. Okay, okay. Thank you. There are over 60,000 meteorites in worldwide collections, but we know where only a handful come from in the solar system. You will find out how camera networks and like the UK Fireball Network, operated by researchers at the University of Glasgow, are working to recover meteorites with orbits and how you can help us recover the first meteorite fall in the UK soil for 30 years. Now, I take a hint from that that there's going to be some work coming out of this. Now, um, Luke Daly's uh, biographical information. Dr. Luke Daly is a lecturer in planetary geoscience in the School of Geographical and Earth Sciences at the University of Glasgow. He studies space rocks to understand where the Earth got its water from. He is a participating scientist in the Japanese space agent's Hayabusa 2 mission uh, to return samples from the asteroid Ryugu and co-leads the operation of the UK Fireball Network to find meteorites in the UK and to try to find out where they came from. With that introduction, look, it's all yours. Thanks very much. So I'll just share my screen and try not to be too nervous. I've never been live on YouTube before, so this is going to be new. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, move that, my own face out of the way. Right, let's get started. So yeah, my name's Luke. Uh, I'm a lecturer, it still sounds weird. I've only just became a lecturer at the University of Glasgow in the COVID era. So imagine that as a baptism of fire for teaching uh, remotely. But anyway, on to, on to kind of science. Uh, this talk is uh, something I want to kind of take you through and introduce you to. Uh, and uh, as you kind of mentioned, um, how you might be able to help out this project as a citizen scientist. And uh, essentially, what we're hoping to be able to do in the project I've been working with, with my collaborators uh, at Imperial College London and over in Australia uh, at Curtin University, uh, as well as a plethora of awesome amateur astronomers uh, in the UK uh, with their own camera networks, is to answer the question, where do space rocks come from? Um, and a space rock is a technical term, well, is a colloquial term for a meteorite. And a meteorite is just a rock from space. Uh, there are several types of meteorites, and they can tell us amazing things about how our solar system formed. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with sort of like uh, meteorite classes, uh, there are kind of th three main groups, uh, really. There are uh, the iron meteorites, which, as the name suggests, are made out of iron. There are the stony meteorites, which, as the name suggests, are made out of stones. And there's the stony irons, as the name suggests, are made of both. Um, and they can all tell us really interesting things about how our solar system came to be and how planets formed. So, for example, the iron meteorites are these uh, iron nickel metal rocks that we think come from the cores of planets. And what I mean by that is a core of a planet is simply a planetary object that has got big enough that uh, the inside melted uh, and it separated out into three layers a core, a mantle, and a crust. So, you have this sort of like uh, onion skin layer structure. Uh, we think iron meteorites come from the core of an old uh, planet that got bust up early in our solar system's history, exposing that core and scattering fragments throughout our solar system. They're really important because that gives us a window into how planetary cores form. How do planets separate into a ball of iron nickel at the, in the middle with iron silicate around the outside and then a crust on the surface? They're also really important for understanding how our Earth came to be and what our own Earth's core is like, because we can't get bits of our own core because it's deep and dark and squishy and hot and miserable uh, down there. We just can't drill that deep. And so these iron meteorites give us a clue about what our own planet's core might look like, what it's made of and what uh, its mineralogy is like. The stony iron meteorites uh, are as the name suggests, made up of metal and stone. Uh, in this case, typically it's a mineral called olivine. Um, and it used to be thought that they came from the core mantle boundary of planets. However, some really awesome recent kind of studies coming out of Oxford University with Claire Nichols uh, has basically shown that these aren't core mantle boundary samples. They are evidence for some of the most climactic events in our solar system, and that's the merger of two planets. So. Uh, one planet that's separated into a core mantle 
uh, cross structure smashes into another one. The core and the mantle of each planet merge together. So you get this beautiful like patchwork of metal interbedded between uh, stony particulates. Um, and then it cools slowly on its outer surface. And that those meteorites are called palisites. Um, the stony meteorites is where I spend most of my time and they're split into two groups. There's the achondrites and they represent the surface, the very outer surface of differentiated planets. So they're the crust of a planetary system. So these meteorites give us ideas about volcanic and impact processes and volcanoes on Mars, the moon, the asteroid Vesta, uh, and more that have since been destroyed, uh, or at least we don't know where they came from, which is a key question we're going to try and answer in this talk. Um, and then uh, the final group of stony meteorites are called chondrites. They're very close to my heart. They're called chondrites because they have uh, inclusions called chondrules, which are these tiny little circular glass beads, uh, essentially the solar system's first lava. Um, and they're really important because they're the oldest rocks in our solar system. They're the oldest rocks you'll ever hold in your hand. They hark back to an era of our solar system right when the sun first started to shine before they were planets. All the minerals inside them, all the textures inside them were formed in the first 10 million years of solar system history. And they, they are the building blocks of everything else. So you build chondrites together to build your other planetary materials, like your iron meteorites, like your palisites, like your achondrites. Um, and so they're really awesome. Before I get too much into the guts of the talk, I'd like to go through a few definitions, because this is sometimes something that people ask at the end or get confused about. Uh, and that is the difference between a meteoroid, a meteor, and a meteorite. Now, a meteoroid is a space rock that's still in space. It's still floating around uh, in, in our solar system, uh, nowhere near the Earth. A meteor uh, is the light in the sky. That's literally all it is. It's the uh, bright light you see when a extraterrestrial object enters the Earth's atmosphere and the atmosphere around it heats up and glows in this kind of plasma uh, due to sort of friction forces. So a meteor is a small one where it's like a small bit of dust uh, or something like a grain of sand enters the top of the Earth's atmosphere. A fireball uh, is what we're kind of really interested in here is where sort of a big kind of basketball sized object or bigger hits the top of the atmosphere. And these things can last for several seconds and they're called fireballs. Um, if a bit of that rock survives its fiery transition through Earth's atmosphere and hits the Earth's surface, it magically becomes a meteorite. There is literally no difference other than that, apart from uh, it's no longer in space, but it magically changes its name uh, from meteoroids to meteorite, which is kind of confusing because it kind of made me always always think kind of philosophically about this or theologically. It's like, what if you caught it? Does it stay a meteoroid? And then if you drop it, it becomes a meteorite. When, when does that thing happen? Uh, but anyway, this is the kind of nomenclature we'll be dealing with and sort of, uh, so you know what I'm talking about going forward. Now, if we want to understand where uh, meteorites come from, where space rocks come from, we can have, there are varieties of ways we can do this and a variety of techniques we can use. Um, the key thing though we want to answer, the key question we're trying to get at in planetary science uh, is how do we form a solar system? How did we go from a big ball of gas and dust uh, in a giant molecular cloud in an early solar nebula collapse that down slowly over time, till the pressure and temperature in the center of that uh, gas or volume is high enough to start nuclear fusion, generating a star in the center. How do you collapse that cloud down into a disc-like structure, which is known as a protoplanetary disc, which is a swirling disc of gas and dust? Um, how does that dust and gas interact come together to form the first rocks, the first asteroids, the first protoplanets, and eventually the planetary system that we see today, um, which has a third rock from the sun on it with life on it that's arguably intelligent. And so what we want to do is understand how we formed this. And there are a number of ways we can do that. Uh, the first way is to use giant telescopes. I think we're on something bonkers in terms of telescope naming like the obscenely large or the incredibly obscenely large telescope. Um, however, we're now able, these things have got so big and so detailed, we're able to look into star forming regions in our galaxy to see stars and protoplanetary disks and new stellar nursery forming in right now. And so the image on the left there, hopefully for you, uh, is an image of the 
from the Armour Space Telescope of a newly formed protoplanetary disk. Uh, you have your star in the center. And this kind of changed the game because for a long time we thought these disks should be these homogeneous masses that extend out from the sun and there's no variation within them. However, what ALMAs keep showing us again and again and again is that we have this structure there. We have this ring system where you have gaps in the disk uh, in between these areas of higher concentrations of gas and dust. And what this could potentially explain is our entire meteorite record. If each of our meteorite classes, each of our meteorite groups were segregated and formed in this kind of stratigraphic sequence, localized in each ring system and material cannot transfer between these rings, you could explain the whole diversity of the meteorite record, which is kind of a really cool idea. Um, however, our solar system doesn't look like this anymore. We don't have that nice trajectory. We can use uh, other telescopes to look at out at our near Earth objects in our asteroid belt and the sort of stuff that's swirling around in our local neighborhood. So this is kind of a map of the near Earth asteroids that we've discovered over the last few, like 30 years or so. And as you can kind of see, as we've got better telescopes and get better at this, there are like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of objects uh, in our local neighborhood. We, I think we're tracking something like 99% of everything above the size of our house. And fortunately, nothing's coming anywhere near us for the next 100,000 years. So that's, that's good. That means we're safe here and we're kind of happy. But this is very far, far removed from that nice stratigraphic ring-like system. Something's happened. And that brings us to one of the sort of more interesting ideas in planetary science uh, called the Grand Tack Hypothesis. This was a proposed idea initially to explain why Mars is really small, because Mars formed further out than the Earth, uh, but it's much smaller than the Earth. Uh, and it should have had a lot more material in that disk structure to accrete from. Like all our models suggest of like, if you sort of form a planet in that region of the disk with the material it would have had access to, you should form a super Earth if not two super Earths, so planets that are much bigger than the Earth. However, Mars is small. And so this Grand Tack hypothesis came in to try and explain that uh, by throwing Jupiter at the problem. So essentially the idea is Jupiter forms early, very quickly, uh, while you still have that protoplanetary disk. It migrates slowly inwards uh, to where Mars, the early Mars would be forming and nicks all Mars' stuff. And then Saturn forms, uh, also migrates in and then drags Sat uh, Jupiter away. So like, well, uh, leave, leave Mars with something. And so Mars is left with this like very little material to form from. Uh, and this kind of is like a really kind of bonkers idea in many ways, but it's starting to explain loads of other aspects of our solar system. Like why we don't have that nice stratigraphy ring system like we're seeing from the ALMA images, why we have an asteroid belt instead, which is a jumbled up mess. And essentially, but as Jupiter would migrate inwards, all the inner type asteroids, which form dry, uh, which are known as S type asteroids, they would have got booted out and scattered into the outer solar system. And then as Jupiter migrates out again uh, with Saturn, it would scatter all the water rich C type asteroids in the outer solar system into the inner solar system, turning the inner solar system into this kind of pinball machine for a few million years and eventually settling out those objects in this jumble that is the asteroid belt. Um, and that kind of brings us to where we are today. We've got our telescopes looking out at asteroids and we can use the light reflected off them to get an understanding about what they're made of and about their chemistry. Um, and we see in the asteroid belt, there might be some structure in there. This is kind of a, with a distance from the sun uh, versus percent, each different asteroid type. And there's kind of some structure, but it's a bit of a mess. And uh, the other graph up here is the meteorite uh, classification system which is an alphabet soup of hell, so don't worry about it. But basically we've got a huge diversity of meteorites and a huge diversity of asteroids. And what we don't have is a link between the two. We don't know where, what meteorites come from or asteroids. Uh, and that's something we would really like to know to understand how our solar system formed. Um, one uh, quite expensive way to do this is by using space missions. And that's something that's been really exciting in the last decade. Uh, lots of space agencies have been sending out probes to various objects, uh, such as the Itakawa mission, which is a Hayabusa, well, sorry, yeah, sorry, the Hayabusa mission, sorry, which is a Japanese space agency mission to the asteroid Itakawa. Um, and it went, landed on that asteroid, uh, collected literally 300 particles that were all about the width of your hair and brought them back. Um, we've been really lucky at Glasgow to receive three of those particles, so 1% of the total volume of material brought back, 
to do some uh, really cool research, which if you want to know more about it, um, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that because it's really fascinating stuff. Uh, there's also the NASA Stardust mission that flew through the tail of a comet and brought back the particles uh, from the cometary tail uh, back to Earth for study in Earth laboratories. Um, and then there are a number of missions that are ongoing right now, uh, such as OSIRIS-REx, which is a NASA-led mission to the asteroid Bennu, and Hayabusa-2, which is uh, another mission uh, from the Japanese Space Agency to the asteroid Ryugu. These are two water-rich asteroids, and so we're hoping to find out a little bit about where Earth's oceans came from, uh, from these missions, as well as linking them to meteorite classes. No list like this would be complete without mentioning Apollo, which was an amazing um, set of missions that not only sent uh, people to the moon, uh, sort of like one small step and all that, it also brought back kilos and kilos and kilos of lunar soil and lunar rock and really advanced our understanding of how the moon formed and the Earth-Moon system came into being. Um, it's a really exciting time to be part of this. This is a video from the Hayabusa 2 mission onto the asteroid Ryugu. And as you can kind of see, it's descending down with this kind of new, new Teletubby-like shoot. It shoots a copper ball into the surface when it gets close, kicking up a load of dust and debris. We're hoping quite a substantial amount of that went up the chute into the sample canister. And that is on its way back and is due to land uh, in Australia on the 6th of December. So next month, uh, which is really exciting. Um, we're really excited about this and I've got everything crossed that the landing goes successfully because uh, we're part of the fine grain sample analysis team for this mission at Glasgow. So we're gonna get, again, three whole particles. We hope they get many more than 300 grains this time, but we're really looking forward to seeing the results of these, which we should have the first inklings of in March next year. Literally the other week, uh, not to be outdone, NASA landed on uh, Bennu. This is the OSIRIS-REx mission coming down, taking off, uh, collecting a huge amount of samples. They actually got way more sample than they bargained for. They almost couldn't close the lid. They got so much. So that's fantastic. And that will be coming back in 2023. So again, really good to look forward to these kind of missions. What these allow us to do, as well as understanding how these primitive asteroids form and potentially the origin of water on Earth, is they provide that direct link between meteorites on Earth and asteroids in space. So we can measure the composition and mineralogy of the S-type asteroid Itakawa from, that was brought back to Earth by the Hayabusa mission and know that it, and look at L-chondrite meteorites on Earth and know they are an exact match. So this is the first time we've been able to say conclusively, S-type asteroids are likely to be ordinary chondrites of type L, at least in this case. However, that can be quite expensive to do uh, so if you're up on your football trivia, Hayabusa costs one Neymar Jr., which is about 200 million pounds. So to do this for literally every single meteorite class and every asteroid type would be a substantially expensive endeavor. Fortunately, space comes to us quite regularly to the tune of about 50,000 tons a year, hits the top of Earth's atmosphere. And you get these beautiful events uh, called fireballs when large objects hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And they, if, they're, if we're lucky, a little bit of extraterrestrial treasure in the form of a meteorite lands on Earth. Um, and we can go out and find these uh, bits of rock uh, in a variety of locations. Uh, the best way we can do this is to go take advantage of the properties of the meteorite. As it comes through uh, Earth's atmosphere, uh, the outer surface turns into a plasma and you eventually get this black glass on its outer surface called the fusion crust. And it is jet black. So if we go looking for these meteorites in areas that are geologically stable over a long period of time um, and have a very good contrast in terms of their color, such as Antarctica, uh, you can find literally thousands of meteorites. And that's kind of where the most success has happened. We have an expedition that goes every year called the Antarctic Search, Search for Meteorites, uh, led by the US. But there's also a Japanese-led mission every year, a Belgian-led mission. And just the other year, uh, the UK led its first one, which came out of Manchester with uh, Dr. Katie Joy. Again, another fantastic speaker. If you haven't already had a strongly recommend uh, getting her here to talk about her expedition to find, the, find UK meteorites from Antarctica. Um, essentially, though, what this takes advantage of is you have white ice and black rocks on top of it. So literally, you can walk across these blue ice fields in Antarctica and every rock you find on the surface will be a meteorite. So it's almost like cheating in many ways, but we don't really complain about that. And we bag 1000 meteorites a year and bring them back. And these tell us a fantastic amount about how our solar system formed just from having them. 
However, they miss one crucial piece of information. We don't know where they came from in the solar system. And that's like trying to do geology with about, so you say if you wanted to understand the geology of Scotland, which is a very complicated area, but you had 5,000 random rocks that were just dumped in your back garden with no idea where they came from, the task of understanding Scottish geology becomes substantially more difficult. What we really want and what we'd dearly love to have is this information, and this is an orbit. So here you have kind of the sun in the center, the major planets in orbit around it. And this uh, is the orbit of a meteorite called Bumbura rock hole which is one of the first meteorites found by the Desert Fireball Network. And so it came in and impacted the Earth, and we were able to image it uh, as it came through the atmosphere and then figure out where it landed and go collect it. And that's really where camera networks come into their own. Um, I'm going to talk about the Desert Fireball Network just because that's where I was lucky enough to do my PhD. Uh, it was the brainchild of a professor called Phil Bland, who's over in Curtin University in Australia. But many other camera networks in and around the world exist that are doing essentially the same thing, trying to image fireballs, that bright light in the sky as meteoroids hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere to triangulate meteorites on the ground. Uh, essentially, the idea is to put a bunch of autonomous camera systems that can sit unattended in the desert for years uh, that take continuous exposures of the night sky every 30 seconds. Um, they look somewhat like this. So you just have a stand with a box with all, that has all your camera, your hard drives uh, and your computer on it, uh, as well as a solar power and a battery to keep it going. Um, we put uh, over 52 cameras all across the central deserts of Australia. Australia is fantastic, not only because it has beautiful night skies with really crystal clear for the most for most of the time. Uh, it's also really, really good in terms of searching. It's a very stable, uh, geologically stable land surface. Uh, and kind of just, you could describe it as a barren, lifeless red wasteland, uh, which is great for looking for little black rocks, because little black rocks on red, barren red dirt stick out and you can see them a mile off. Um, and so it's really good searching area for finding meteorites. So we put out 52 cameras uh, in, uh, in and around Australia, and that allowed us to cover nearly a million square kilometers of Australian skies, which is about a third of the continent. And we were able to start beaming back images like this, which is a fireball of a quite large uh, meteoroid hitting the top of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and we realized quite quickly that 52 cameras taking an image every 30 seconds, all night, every night, is a lot of images. It's nearly a thousand images per camera. Um, and to be the grad student has to go through 1,000 images times 52 cameras every day is time consuming. And that was me for a while. So I'm very glad we then decided to go an automated route, go in, uh, write some software that can detect these events, figure out what their position in the sky is, triangulate them down. You'll notice this image is chopped into long and short dashes. Uh, that's a really awesome timing sequence because 30 seconds is a long period of time for a fireball to enter. We really want to know when in that 30 seconds this fireball arrived and when the light went out. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Robert Howie, uh, postdoc over in uh, Australia, uh, figured out a way of using something called a De Bruin sequence, uh, which, uh, forgive me, I'm not a mathematician, is uh, the shortest number of non-repeat, a shortest sequence of non-repeating uh, segments. So each one of those long and short dashes, if you can measure five of them, that gives you a unique timestamp uh, in that image uh, to sub millisecond precision. So we know the exact millisecond where the light turned on as that meteorite hit the top of the atmosphere and the exact millisecond, the final one went out. Uh, and because we've got these long and short dashes, we can figure out how it's slowing down and get a really good idea of the model of that trajectory. Um, some of our cameras have been spectacular. This is uh, one from Heisen in Australia. It's been basically working nonstop and has seen hundreds of fireball events. Uh, this is kind of a montage of all of the things it's seen, which is fantastic. Um, obviously, we're taking pictures of the sky all the time. So sometimes you get things you don't want. So if a bird decides to roost on one of your cameras, this is the only image you see all night, which is not great. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, my colleagues in Australia have built this automated pipeline that basically a camera will take an image, it will figure out if there's a fireball in it. If it thinks it sees a fireball, it will ping all its mates, all the other cameras in the local area, say, hey, did you see the same thing too? 
If they have, it will do a rough triangulation, a rough orbit, a rough model to see how much material might have survived and where it might have been. Uh, for us, and so then we just kind of wake up in the morning with a ping from the camera saying, hey, we've seen something, you should check it out. Uh, see if there's a meteorite to go search for. This is the kind of triangulation we'd get if we have multiple cameras, these kind of stations in red, imaging a fireball, we can basically do glorified 3D trigonometry to, as those lines, uh, those planar features as we see, will all intersect as a line with the fireball. We can then figure out where it is in Earth's atmosphere and where it's going. Uh, we can then model it down, and my uh, colleague Ellie Sansom uh, and uh, Martin Town have done a fantastic job of modeling all the different possibilities of like the shape of the meteoroid, the mass of it, how it's changed uh, during the ablation period, during the fireball event, and then how the wind might have taken it to get a, a really accurate strewn field, basically a predicted of a surface of the Earth where that meteorite might be. Uh, depending on its mass and depending on its shape. This, once we have that information, we can then go out in trucks uh, into the Australian outback. And this is an expedition I went on to South Australia to try and find uh, a particular meteorite. Um, however, as you'll see, uh, I'm not the luckiest person in the world, uh, but this area initially was perfect. And we thought this is gonna be great. Uh, it's not just the typical Australian surface, it's a salt lake. So white salt, black rock, really good. Um, so we set out uh, in our sort of search pattern, which is essentially you all stand up in a line, um, sort of a few meters apart and just walk across the surface. It's kind of like body searching, only you're trying to find a meteorite, not a missing person. So it's a lot less stressful and a lot better for us uh, mentally. Um, however, one day uh, during this expedition, uh, we were about two hours from camp and these quite large rain clouds uh, were sort of like appearing on the horizon and we thought, Okay, everyone, let's call that a day. Uh, we don't want to get caught in that. It's 45 degrees. We've done, we've done quite a bit. Let's go home. Then an hour from camp, the rain clouds turned into some quite substantial thunderheads. Uh, and so we sort of put a bit of a wiggle on. When we were 10 minutes from camp, this started happening behind us. Uh, and we literally just uh, managed to get back to the wonderful Faraday cages that are our cars and our trucks, dived in, shut the doors before this happened all around us. Uh, the heavens literally opened, drowning our camp, turning it into a lake. Uh, and then I got banned from field trips um, because this had happened. This happened five days in a row on this trip. And this had happened every single time I'd gone out in the field. And bearing in mind Australia is a desert environment, this doesn't happen very often. And so, yeah, people put one and one together and jonahed me. Um, and then this event happened, which is a fireball... Um, that happened just before Christmas, uh, was seen by four cameras, um, had a really steep trajectory, which was really cool. So it was coming in at a very high angle. So our strewn field was very, very small and very, very tight. Um, and what was really nice is it went slap bang into the middle of the largest salt lake in Australia, which is Kathithanga or Lake Pear. Um, so we were really hopeful that this thing would have dropped a meteorite. Uh, so the team, sans me, uh, went out. Uh, what was really nice about this expedition is because uh, Kathy Thunder or Lake Air is a sort of special region of interest for the local Aboriginal community. And we were able to fortunately get them on board with the project. They were able to take us out onto the lake, showing us the safe routes that we, our vehicles wouldn't get stuck. And so without them, we probably wouldn't have been as successful uh, as we were with this expedition. We got the local air force involved, uh, so sent an eye in the sky up to see if we could see some evidence of where the meteorite landed. Uh, the searching area was really good. Uh, Salt Lake, again, perfect white, uh, white landscape, black meteorite. This is going to be, hopefully, child's play. Um, however, it's not just me. Uh, while they were out there, they got a severe weather warning. And like, again, rain doesn't happen on Cathy Thunder Lake Air. And this was going to be like one of the biggest storms in a uh, uh, century. Um, however, we saw this image, which is like, that's it, right? That's the hole. That's the hole it made. Uh, go get that. But because that was seen from the air, uh, the plane was going so fast, the GPS didn't get quite a good register on it. And so this is the GPS path of uh, everyone frantically trying to find it uh, with the storm clouds gathering. Uh, Phil was quite sort of devastated at this point, not really sure uh, if this was going to be a success. Uh, and then we recaptured it again. It's Believe it or not, it's in this image. Uh, it's here, uh, believe it or not. And so Phil runs over, 
uh, starts literally just digging in the dirt uh, about sort of half a meter down into this like congealed sticky gunk uh, and eventually pulls out a little meteorite, uh, which is fantastic and exactly what we were after. Uh, so this was the Marilli meteorite. It was a H5 ordinary chondrite. It's the first one found by the digital network, but the third one found by the camera observatory as a whole. Uh, it was found on New Year's Eve, believe it or not, which is really cool. Uh, and it was about one and a half kilograms. And where, where it landed, it literally punched half a meter down into the salt lake. So it was really lucky we got this. Um, oh, and then, yeah, they hightailed it out of there. The heavens opened again and Lake Air filled up for the first time in 100 years. So, uh, yeah, we were very, very lucky to get this rock. Um, so, but what was kind of nice about this is finding this rock basically means that all our hard work over the previous five years, building this network, building this project, building this automated pipeline works, and we can find meteorites at the end of it that have their orbits intact. Um, and so this really meteorite, we were able to tack it out into an orbit in and around the asteroid belt um, between Mars and Jupiter which is really awesome. And we're gonna be working on sort of clockwork models to try and figure out what specific asteroid or asteroid family this comes from. There was another fall uh, quick, quite soon after that, this time on Halloween. Uh, I'm not sure what it is with meteorite falls in Australia and pagan holidays, but there we go. We have N equals two and two. Uh, this uh, was the Dingle Dell meteorite. Um, we saw it from several stations, but what was annoying about this event is all the stations were from the same direction. Uh, around Perth. And so we didn't have quite a, as good a triangulation as we'd like on this rock. Fortunately, a citizen scientist using our app that we developed saw it from the other side and was able to provide like a, another vantage point that enabled us to sort of hone in our uh, trajectory. And so we were able to recover this meteorite uh, called Dingle Dow uh, within a few days of it falling. So no rain had fallen on this rock. Uh, it's pristine, perfectly preserved. And to kind of give you an idea about how awesome uh, my colleagues are doing on modeling this thing, it fell within about 200 meters of the predicted fall line for a meteorite of that mass and shape, which is pretty awesome. Um, this meteorite is probably one of the most pristine meteorites you'll ever get because it saw no rain. The minerals inside it that typically get washed away if you have your meteorite rained on or exposed to the Earth's environment for any length of time, like salt-like organics will be still preserved in this. We even had to prepare it in a special way so no fluids went anywhere near it. Um, if you were at Queenie Chen's last talk from Royal Holloway, she talked about the really interesting research she was doing into salt crystals. Um, this uh, would be an ideal candidate to look for those kind of minerals and understand how fluids evolved on these asteroids because it's preserved in this rock. But at the end of that project, after five years, we built up the largest database of fireball events with orbits uh, on, in the world. And this is kind of a visualization graphic of this. The orange uh, lines are the orbits and the teal dots are the meteoroids coming into the Earth, uh, that third rock from the sun right there. Um, and even though we didn't necessarily find all these meteorites uh, because we just didn't have the people power, we can start understanding where stuff is coming from in our solar system. So for example, the Geminid meteor shower is coming in in this big uh, collection and absolutely nailing us here. Uh, and so we're able to use this to kind of start building a picture of where material is coming from in our solar system, which is phenomenal. Off the back of the success of the Desert Fireball Network, uh, which is where the UK Fireball Network comes in, we've got funding to take this project global to set up something called the Global Fireball Observatory, which is essentially taking the heritage, the technology developed with the Desert Fireball Network and putting it around the world. So we've got networks in the States, we've got networks in Canada, we've got networks in Morocco, we've got networks in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and myself and colleagues at Imperial College London, um, Natural History Museum, Open University are starting to set up the UK Fireball Network. The aim of this whole Global Fireball Observatory is to try and cover 2% of the Earth's land surface, which is a lot, uh, in cameras to image the night sky 24 hours a day both from both hemispheres to get a uh, sort of five times increase in coverage uh, than the Desert Fireball Network had. This will mean we see five meteorite falls per year. So we'll have five meteorite dropping fireballs every year. Oh, sorry, every month even. Um, 
And over the lifetime of the project, we should see over 300 meteorite fall, which is brilliant because statistically, in that number, we should get one of every meteorite type. So that includes even rare stuff like Martian meteorites, like lunar meteorites, and could even include a comet, which would be like the icing on the proverbial cake uh, if we got a piece of a comet back. And in each case, every rock we collect will have the orbital information, essentially providing the same information that sample return missions do, but by uh, imaging fireballs and finding meteorites on Earth. The UK Fireball Network has a few challenges that we didn't have to worry about with the Desert Fireball Network. Notably, the landscape uh, is very different. Uh, in Australia, you had that barren red soil. And in the UK, you have dark green deciduous forest, uh, as well as like marshy, boggy uh, highlands up in Scotland. And so finding Little Black Rock against that background is substantially more challenging. However, we have some advantages that the Australia doesn't have, uh, particularly in the outback. We have many more people per unit area than the outback of Australia. So hopefully, what I'm, what I'm hoping, uh, talking to you all, is that we'll get some interested people who might be willing to come out with us uh, to help us search, because it's going to be literally as many boots on the ground we can get, the more likely we are to find a thing. However, it's not all doom and gloom. The UK's got quite a good heritage of recovering uh, meteorites uh, that have been seen to fall. Uh, the last one in Scotland was nearly 100 years ago, uh, which was the Strathmore meteorite that fell on the 3rd of December 1917. Um, it was a really cool event because it was an uh, airburst, so it blew up into four fragments uh, in the upper atmosphere. And one of those fragments absolutely nailed this woman's house, um, as you can see from this gift here. What's also interesting, and I should mention, is this is probably one of the earliest examples of fake news in the modern media, because these people live in Scotland. And while this meteorite did hit their roof and make a hole, you do not want a hole for any length of time in your property. It's not very good for interior decoration if it rains. So by the time the journalists and media had got out there, they'd fixed it. They'd fixed the hole in the roof. Uh, not to be kind of uh, sort of dissuaded or hard done by, the journalists decided to ink in onto the image uh, a fake hole, um, which makes a good gift, but uh, yeah, uh, it's not actually true. I also really like sort of looking into this event and looking at the sort of news cuttings that appear there, which is like a scintling incandescent mess and heard it fizzing bombshells from space, giving you an idea that clickbait is not a modern idea. It's uh, been around in Scotland at least for nearly 100 years. Um, and then in the UK as a whole, the most recent one was the Glatton Mitri uh, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, again, it was an ordinary chondrite. So similar to Australia with its uh, pagan holidays, we seem to have a trend of ordinary chondrites of type L6. Not sure what, if there's anything to read into that. Um, but anyway, this one fell in a chap called Arthur Pettifor's back garden. And again, looking at the cuttings and sort of the quotes from him, it's hilarious, saying he heard a whistling noise and then a disturbance in his conifer hedge, followed by a thud. And uh, he felt lucky to not have been hit by it, but was more alarmed that it narrowly missed his greenhouse which kind of gives you a window into the priorities of an elderly man in 1990s England, uh, which I kind of like. But that's all very well and good. However, one meteorite of a searchable size should hit UK soil every year. So something about from the size of a golf ball to the size of your fist should land on the UK every year. Um, and we haven't found one for over 30 years. Uh, so we're batting way below our average. And that's where networks like the UK Fireball Network come in. This is a light pollution map of the UK, uh, where red and white areas are horrible uh, near sort of like big metropolitan areas that chuck out a load of light. Uh, the sort of clear to blue areas are really nice. They're sort of uh, dark sky parks in and around sort of Galloway and then the sort of like northern highlands of Scotland. And so those areas are amazing. And so that's where we kind of want to put the majority of our cameras. We have a few benefits that Australia didn't have uh, in the fact that the UK is much smaller, so we don't need 52 cameras to cover a third of it. We just need 12 to cover the whole lot. Um, and the night skies can be, away from these uh, sort of high light pollution areas, absolutely stunning when it's not cloudy. Um, and so you can see these amazing fireball events. And so we're confident that despite this, we should still see fireballs and be able to recover meteorites. So we've already installed a network of six cameras, one in Galloway, one in Wales, and then one down the spine of England. We have plans, uh, hopefully after COVID, once uh, Australia opens up its borders and we're all kind of back with vaccines and safe, uh, getting a series of a, a second series of cameras to sort of fill in the rest. So fill in the northern parts of Scotland, 
uh, get one over in Northern Ireland and down in Cornwall to be a truly UK network. But this, and this is what our cameras kind of look like. We have different kinds of stations, uh, but they all kind of run off the same design. Within them, uh, if you're kind of interested in sort of the nuts and bolts, it's literally just an off-the-shelf DSLR camera with an all-sky fisheye lens, uh, with a then a little video camera next to it. We have this kind of battery of hard drives. I think we're up to like eight terabytes each, just so we can keep that much data of one, uh, one fireball image, well, one image every 30 seconds. Uh, so these things can sit on a roof or in the middle of a field for 12 to 18 months without us having to go near it. They have this really nice onboard computer, which connects to Wi-Fi, which talks to the other cameras and does that event detection. Uh, this is an example of one uh, just sort of installed on uh, one of my colleagues, Martin Suffolk's roof, uh, which is really nice uh, down in the south of England. And this is a sort of video of the day in the, uh, day in the night of one of our cameras. And as you can see, uh, we have a cloud problem in the UK. It obscures quite a lot of our nights and a lot of our imaging. But uh, every now and then, when the sky clears, uh, wait for it any second now. When it clears, you do start to see stars, even in the south of England location where you've got that substantial light pollution. So we can start seeing planes, we can start seeing satellites, we can start seeing meteors. And so if we have multiple triangulations from the same event, we could hopefully find meteorites on the ground. And we've started getting results almost immediately. This was a fireball on the 3rd of November, uh, which is kind of a really small one. Didn't drop a meteorite, but that's fine. That's allowed. Here's one on the 12th of November, 2018. Again, a bit bigger this time, but again, didn't drop a meteorite. Um, and while we were setting this up and started talking to sort of the local community, we realized that we're not the only game in town. There are a bunch of amazing groups that were already established uh, with camera networks in the UK, taking pictures of the night sky. One of those groups is called SCAMP, or the System for Capture of Asteroid and Meteorite Paths, uh, which is run by a, a fellow called Jim Rowe uh, and also supported by Ashley King at the Natural History Museum. And this is a series of cameras that are built off the heritage of the Frippon network, which is the French fireball camera network. And they have a slightly different uh, tactic than us. Uh, they use a, just a purely a video camera rather than our digital camera. Uh, but the aim is the same. They're, but while both our systems are optimized to capture fireballs, we just do it in subtly different ways. What I really like about um, the SCAMP network and the Frippon network is it's a genius uh, sort of concept of acronyming. Uh, so if anyone's up on their French, uh, maybe Laura, you might get this. Um, the, Frippon in French means mischievous small child. And scamp in English also means mischievous small child. So whoever came up with that, cued off to them. There is an amateur network uh, using CCTV cameras called U the UK Meteor Observation Network or UK Mon. They have a series of cameras primarily designed to look for meteors. So the small faint events that our cameras are not optimized for. So they provide a window into our upper atmosphere that we don't see, but they also see fireballs and are also very interested in recovering meteorites with orbits. Uh, in and amongst there, there's also Nematode, uh, which is another network, the Global Meteor Network, and then literally hundreds, if not thousands, of individual amateur astronomers who have their own cameras on their roofs or in their uh, sort of on, on their property to the point where there is a substantial amount of data being retrieved from the night sky, including like you can do this with a doorbell camera. Uh, that's kind of how good digital cameras have got now is even doorbell cameras can add into this database. And so kind of one of the key things I'm hoping you're kind of thinking and is what we thought as well is, hey, why don't you all work together? Because um, you're all trying to do the same thing. And that's exactly what we did. We founded something called UK4, which is the UK Fireball Alliance, which brings together like-minded groups that all want to recover the first meteorite in the UK for 30 years. So that's the camera networks, the amateur astronomers, uh, curatorial facilities like the Hunterian Museum, uh, the Naturalist Museum in London and in Cardiff, uh, as well as sort of academic institutions that are interested in the sample analysis. So like Cambridge, Manchester, the Open University, us here in Glasgow, Imperial. Um, 
And this is a sort of really nice group, this idea of sharing all our data, making sure our data can talk to each other, making it translates into all our different methods and algorithms to predict uh, orbits, to predict full positions, to predict strewn fields. Um, and so it's been really lovely sort of being a part of this group and so long may it continue. And again, the idea was data sharing, seeing the same event. Now, this is one of the first sort of joint observations we had back in 2019, which was a fireball in Belgium. Uh, so it fell over Belgium, uh, but Southern cameras of UK Mon and Scamp saw it. We also saw it too. Uh, this is our image of it. And if you're anything like me, uh, just like, don't, don't worry. This is not it. This is the moon. And for a lot, the longest time I was like, wow, that's such a bright event. No, no, the fireball's over here. Uh, unfortunately, but it was still big, but uh, it kind of goes behind this tree and then off into Belgium. So that was really cool. Um, and then we had another one uh, more recently, uh, just before lockdown on the 16th of Feb, 2020. UK Mon saw it, which was awesome. We caught it really nicely. This is a really uh, sort of clear image of it. Scamp saw it twice, which is again, fantastic. And when we put it through our models, when we shared our data and triangulated it, our models spat out a really surprising result. And that is that 10 grams of material probably survived and hit the deck. And 10 grams might not sound like a lot, but that's like a golf ball sized uh, meteorite. You could go search for that. And that's exactly kind of what we're looking for. There's just one small problem uh, and that's where it landed, which was directly into the North Sea. So unfortunately no searching expedition for this one. Uh, even, even with scuba gear, I think this one's just gone. Um, but what it shows is that this UK fall initiative will work. We can combine our data and get accurate fall positions and accurate models to find that when the big one happens, when a meteorite lands on UK soil, we can go get it. Um, so that's the plan. I'd also like to kind of briefly mention some of the other things we see uh, as kind of like a fallout of being on the sky all the time. We're continuously imaging the night sky from several locations around the planet. And we've realized there might be other applications of our data. And these are some of the ones we've started exploring. Uh, so the first one is satellites. We realized we could see satellites in our images. And that's really kind of important because we want, like that's really important for planetary defense. Um, there is a lot more stuff getting put up there. There's a lot more risk involved with, and these, these super constellations that are going up are making our local uh, environment very busy. There's been a load of near misses, such as the Fermi Cosmos incident, where they realized that the Fermi uh, satellite uh, was on a collision course with the Cosmos satellite, uh, and they had to take evasive maneuver to sort of get out of the way, uh, which is unfortunately nothing happened. But if you've ever seen gravity, that kind of gives you a dramatized window into the sort of risk we're having. We could lose access to space if we have too many collisions and produce these debris clouds. Uh, and so we've been able to start imaging satellites. Uh, believe it or not, there are a few in here. You see one whizzing over there. This is a geostationary dot. You see, it's not a bit of dust on your screen. It's just a geostationary satellite moving. Uh, and my friend and colleague, Trent Janssen Sturgeon, was able to model this and predict where all these satellites were in real time. So this is a visualization that refreshes every six seconds. And we're keeping track of almost everything that's up there and where it is. And this kind of refreshes. So it's a real time database, which is awesome. So we can have accurate situational awareness in our local space environment. Um, we also don't just see meteorites. Uh, this was an interesting event. I wanted to focus on that dot. Uh, essentially, this was a bright event that started low in Earth's atmosphere, then went up and then changed direction. And uh, there's suddenly very, very few things that that can be. Certainly nothing natural. And we're kind of the first thing was like, do we tell anybody that that's that's weird? And then my colleague Hadrian triangulated it back down to the ground uh, where it came from, and it turns out it was a sort of standard launch of a Chinese satellite uh, that just happened to take it over our network in Australia. So with these cameras, we can see launches, and in fact, we even be able to help with uh, ongoing sample return missions such as Osiris Rex. When Osiris Rex did its gravitational slingshot. We were able to see Osiris Rex in our cameras. I'm, I'm told by people I trust that it's in this image somewhere. Uh, I've still not found it, but I believe them. But we were able to then sort of like figure out the orbit of Osiris Rex and its trajectory to sort of check NASA's numbers that it is actually on its way to the asteroid Bennu. Um, we also, as uh, kind of 
really interesting. Uh, if you remember sort of a few years back, the LIGO mission for gravitational waves detected a neutron star merger. So two very dense stars merged together. Uh, everyone got very excited because gravitational waves are very cool, Nobel Prizes, and there's a lot of really awesome focus class going involved with this. I got really excited because it's the first direct evidence of a process called R process nucleosynthesis, which is where wacky elements like gold, platinum, and iridium form, which uh, I like, so that's what got me interested. But what this what does this have to do with the Desert Fireball Network and the UK Fireball Network is we turns out we were the first optical observatory on the sky when that event happened. Before all the world's telescopes turned to that point in the sky, we were already there because we were already taking images. And so a bunch of my colleagues ended up on those papers with a quarter, no, like a fifth of the astronomy community, basically constraining the minimum brightness of that event, um, which was really kind of fun. Anyway, kind of going back and wrapping up now, the key thing we want to do with the UK Fireball Network is get meteorites on the ground with orbits by imaging their fireballs to be able to tie them back into space to figure out what asteroid and asteroid family they come from to build up a stratigraphic geological model of our solar system and how it came to be and how it evolved over time. And this is where I'm hoping you guys will come in. Uh, we also developed a free app called Fireballs in the Sky, uh, which is a really awesome, if nothing else, a really awesome star map. It also gives you information about when the next uh, meteor shower maximum is and where in the sky it will be. But if you see a fireball, uh, when we're allowed out at night again, uh, and when you're stargazing, you can use this app to report it. Um, so you can uh, basically use the inbuilt GPS and gyrometer of your phone. If you see a fireball, you can point it at the point in the sky where you saw the light start, click, point at the area of the sky where you saw the light go out and click, tell us how long it was, how many seconds the fireball lasted, what color it was, did it fragment, did you hear a sound? And you can send that to us and if our cameras see it and we can build in enough observations, we can use that in our models to predict where that fireball and hopefully meteorite ended up. Um, uh, it works for pretty much, uh, well, so it works for Android and iOS uh, sort of uh, smartphones. Sorry if you have a Windows phone. Um, I also bought one when they first came out and we learned from our mistakes, I guess. Um, but so yeah, I would encourage you to sort of download this. It's free and it's awesome. Um, if you're also interested, when we have a fireball event of keeping up with the project, uh, you can either sign up to the UK Fall uh, mailing list on the UK Fall website, or if you want more information about the UK Fireball Network specifically, uh, you can sign up to uh, UKFN at imperial.ac.uk mailing list, where we'll be sending out information about the project and any search efforts that we end up with. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all once again for having me. It's been lovely speaking to you all, and I'd be more than happy to answer any, any questions. Thanks very much. Uh, that, hi, thank you. Lovely. Um, I don't, as I said, I don't, I, I don't know how you manage that without having a drink. You know, to talk <laughs> that amount of time. Well fun. done. Now, to everyone who's listening in, if you want to raise a question on Luke, I can ask you to do use the chat box. And if you can put the question in a, a short version, I will send it to Luke by, by, uh, by, uh, on your behalf. However, if it's difficult, I'll try and ask uh, Alistair to, uh, to unmute you and you can put your uh, question direct. So I, I now get a chance. Thank you again. Look, a, lo a lovely, a lovely lecture. Uh, my little 14-inch laptop. I'm, I'm right up next to it, trying to figure out what what's on most of your slides. Um, but I get I get a chance to well ask a question. But I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to just give you some thoughts. You said, uh, well, firstly, um, I remember back to when I moved into my house. And I was uh, raking the back garden, setting up a base for a hut. And I found stones and stones and stones. And I thought to myself, you know, are these just ordinary things? <laughs> or could they, be, could they be worth anything? So I'm sorry, they're now in my hut base, so you won't be able to get them unless you pull my <laughs> hut down. So that, that was the stones in my back garden. The second thing I would say to you is, um, 
with regards to being sent to Coventry by your colleagues in Australia because of the five days of thunderstorms, I'd just like to remind you that the world-famous um, quantum physicist, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, great theoretical physicist, he, every time he went into a lab, he broke something. <laughs> So his, his, practical, his practical colleagues threw him out. They wouldn't let him in a lab. So I wouldn't worry too much about, uh, about thunderstorms in South Australia. <laughs> I was thinking I should, like, sell my services to drought-ridden countries and just <laughs> turn up and see what happens. Uh, when, the science, when the science dry, dries up, just, just, just act as a water diviner. Yeah. Well, there's, well, there's my question gone. <laughs> Uh, and I'll have a look at the, the chat the chat box to see if there's anything. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, put your hand up or go into the chat box. Hang on a minute. Oh, there's uh, a Robert Law in Dundee. Robert, do you want to unhook yourself and, and ask the question? Yeah, Zach, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, thanks, go ahead. Thanks, uh, that, that was amazing. We actually have part of the Strathmore uh, meteorite uh, on display in the observatory where I work in Dundee, uh, and we have an exhibition on it. Uh, and back in the 1970s, I was involved with meteor kind of research work with Robert McNaught, I do Rob McNaught. And we did uh, really ancient technology. We were using Soviet Lubitel, Lubitel cameras with 120 roll film with a shutter rotating around. We had the Edinburgh University Astronomical Society, the Dundee Astronomical Society, and I was a member of the Glasgow Astronomical Society uh, and the University of St Andrews. And we had people watching at different meteor showers. And we did triangulation. Uh, the Bell Rock, I got asked to go up to Dundee and I went up to the Mills Observatory to take part in this stuff and we had to watch bits of the sky, all that data was sent in. And those are the days before home computers. So we got access to a mainframe computer at the University of Edinburgh, and we actually managed to find a meteorite through all that triangulation. Oh, uh, wow. Awesome. I'd like to hear that. Uh, uh, and that's just absolutely fascinating. And I get people coming into the observatory telling me that they've seen meteorites and firebox. So the local people that will, will phone the Mills Observatory. And, and if I'm there, I, I can get stuff and I can pass that on to you. Please do. Yeah. It, like uh, we get we get lots of folks send us send us images of rocks thinking think they found meteorites. And yeah. and as as the nature of the beast, meteorites are rare, but please, please do send send your images. Oh, like because every them. now and then you get one and yeah. it's it's awesome. Um, um We've got a few few uh, others coming in with with questions, and there's one here from, believe it or not, Julian, who says, "Look, a great talk. Uh, can you explain the De Bruyne uh, sequence again and how it works with images, videos, and stills from the DSL DSLR, please?" Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm and actually, one for you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, this is where I kind of out myself as not the person that wrote that code. Uh, so, um, the, so from my understanding of the De Bruyne sequence, it's essentially a, sequ a non-repeating sequence. So the shortest non-repeating sequence you can fit in 30 seconds. Um, the way it works and the way it manifests in the image is you have a liquid crystal shutter in the way of your optics for your DSLR camera that turns clear, uh, sorry, turns opaque and then clear in the same cadence as the De Bruyne sequence. So it will go like dark, like dark, clear, dark, clear, dark, clear, which is why that image was cut up into long and short dashes. So your fireball is normally, if you see it with your eyes, is just one continuous line. Our ones tend to be chopped up into timestamps. And essentially what's happening there is that liquid crystal shutter is turning on and off, blocking out the light. And so if a fast moving object like a fireball is moving across the image, it will move during the dark bit and then you'll see the light in a new place and then as it goes dark again, it'll you just get this repeating sequence. Um, does that does that ex answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. So. It does. <laughs> no, thank you. It does because uh, I wasn't sure whether it was a video image or it was um, uh, still, and I couldn't yeah. work out how it was done. So thank you. 
Yeah. So the video have next to kind of backs it up. So we have the video to kind of compare and make sure our timestamp works. But the DSLR is a lot more precise than our video cameras. Right. Hi, Luke. There's Thank one you. coming in, Fia Laura, and she says, Sarah asks the precise name of the mobile app. And she yep. says, I have a question too. So I'll put Laura on audio and she can ask that. So where do you get the mobile app? Uh, it's called Fireballs in the Sky. Uh, Alistair Tellis just dropped it in the chat, which is what I was literally about to do. So thanks for that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you just go on to like Google Play Store or whatever the equivalent is for Apple and you should be able to download it there. Laura, your extra question, would you like to bring your audio up and ask the extra question, please? Yep, can you hear me? Yep. Right, um, I was wondering if there's any law surrounding finding meteorites, for instance, would it be a crime to open one up if you were to find one? Not that I would do it, but... Uh, I mean, oh, there's no, it's not a crime to open <laughs> one up. Um, uh, there's, I'm, I'm actually still not 100% sure. This is the kind of a question you'd have to ask museums but um from my understanding uh it counts as treasure <laughs> under government jurisdiction so in theory it belongs to the crown and i think what that means in reality is the natural history museum in london or your local museum gets first dibs to buy it off you and uh, they should get at least 20 percent of them of the main mass to keep and curate for scientific research and uh, part of the collection. Now, different nations have different rules about this, which is quite fun. So Australia is super strict. It's like, it belongs to the government, give it back, uh, which brings in a few problems because people are like, no, don't take my meteorite, it's special, it's mine. And so they don't come forward with these space rocks, which is a bit, a bit disappointing. However, the opposite end of the spectrum is in Morocco, where you own it and you can sell it for a lot. Um, and a load of meteorites end up in Morocco that fall all across the Sahara by sort of nomadic tribes, and they've realized that meteorites are valuable and they've got really good at finding them. So they've stripped the Sahara bear of meteorites and you have a correlation between the border of Morocco and a load of meteorite finds. So because they just take it there and go, I found it here, it's mine now, I will take $30 a gram if it's a rare one. Right. The, the, okay, Laura, the, the questions are coming in thick and fast now from Polly Roger. Uh, are there any programs or projects run by the UK Fireball Network that schools could get involved with? Um, in an official capacity, uh, we don't have anything yet. It's something I'm working on trying to get funding to develop a sort of citizen science outreach program uh, in its own right. However, uh, myself and the group I work with just love coming into schools, talking to students, um, getting involved with the local community. So um, if it's like, yeah, if, if you, if something you think your school would benefit from, it's something you like doing, please get in touch. I would totally turn up and show the students some meteorites and talk to them. Like it's the best part of the job. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah. If we don't. So the answer is we don't have an official program, but, more than happy to just turn up ad hoc and something are working the on pandemic, plans to do that. Yeah, the pandemic sort of puts a, a, a dampener on that, you know, just mm -hmm. going into schools. Yeah. But uh, it's the risk that we have to take. However, uh, what I will say, what one quick on that on that note, um, my colleague Anya O'Brien uh, and uh, some of her collaborators have just launched an amazing outreach program called Roving with Rosalind, uh, which is based on sort of getting science communication and planetary science into rural communities and depraved areas in Glasgow and in and around Scotland. And they have these amazing kits that you can hire out to do activities like build your own Lego Rover that you can control via Wi-Fi, sending it around, which is really cool, um, as well as other like really cool activities. So uh, check that out, uh, Roving with Rosalind. I'll try and find a link for you and drop that in the chat. Um, but yeah, that's a really, really fun project. Excellent. I, I, I like the rover. I, I think I could get involved in that. Uh, the next question up from, uh, from Billy Russell. Uh, he says, Luke, have you been given or asked for a sample of the Chelyabinsk meteorite, the one that we saw going down in Russia? 
Have you come across I, that in your travel? I, I have not. I think, oh, I think the university has a piece. I've not personally studied it. Um, in, terms, in terms of Russian meteorites, I'm, I'm actually working on another stone called Azerki, uh, which fell in Russia and was seen by the Finnish network and then a load of Russian uh, uh, lorry cameras. And so from both of those, they were able to triangulate it. So I'm, I'm working on, on that stone, but I, I've not had the pleasure of working on Chelly Bings. Because, uh, well, yeah, that's another really exciting, exciting stone. Okay. Uh, we've got another one from, from Julian. Uh, if, 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 could you provide all the URLs that you mentioned and any other information, please, I can then post on the website calendar for members to refer back to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, That's just an admin one from... Uh, it, it will, at least when people watch the, the YouTube, they'll be able to refer to the website and carry on their interest. Robert Law comes back through from Dundee. In Scotland, it comes under treasure trove, he says, and yeah, yeah. would take it to a museum. Main place is the National Museum of Scotland. So Robert concurs with you. Let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, perhaps I could uh, I could ask Luke maybe a, a, a tough question, but just give yeah. me a, a brief answer. Um, the start of your talk, you mentioned how Jupiter and Saturn migrated around inside the solar system. And the way that you described it uh, really made it sound like that was instrumental in transferring the ice-rich asteroids from the outer solar system in. So is that the reason why we have so much water on Earth? That is one of the key kind of ways people think that happened. Um, there's, there's a whole other talk I could give on origin of water in our solar system. Uh, and basically the front runner right now is those water-rich asteroids, which is why they're the target of OSIRIS-REx and they're the target of uh, Hayabusa 2, because they're in the meteorite record, those type of rocks are the most like Earth's oceans in terms of their composition. Uh, they're not perfect though, uh, which is kind of where some of the work I've been doing comes in and the work I've been doing on the Itakawa mission specifically, trying to figure out if there's another water reservoir that we haven't found in our solar system and how big that would be and if it would be enough to balance Earth's oceanic composition books. Um, comets, for interest, are way off. They're, they're stupid heavy uh, in, water, in heavy water, so deuterium, uh, the sort of heavy version of hydrogen. They have way too much of that to even come close to explaining Earth's ocean. So I think most models say you can only get maybe 1% comet to the Earth as part of its water, which is not enough to get the nice pale blue dot that we see today. So yeah, but that's that's a whole other talk. <laughs> Excellent. On uh, that, water. That sounds to me like you've already agreed to give a whole nother talk. We look forward to it. <laughs> yes. I mean, it I mean, me. a good option might be in March once we've got the preliminary data back from Hayabusa two, and I could talk about our literally hot off the press findings. We can assume, assuming it lands safely, I'm trying not to jinx anything by saying, Yeah, it's going to be great, it's going to be fine. And then Secretary up, David, please take a it note. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a question, and I wrote one word down contamination with mm -hmm. your, your meteorites on Earth. What's, what's the main contamination you get? Uh, it depends on the meteorite and how long it's been there, uh, is the sort of an answer to that question. So, kind of one of the first things that happens is it lands on earth probably gets rained on organic material can like start getting in it'll get colonized by bacteria pretty quickly uh, which is bizarre to think about um, and so your hydrated minerals your volatiles your salts your organics will just completely change like they'll become terrestrial and you'll lose that primitive extraterrestrial signal the longer they're there the more changes happen so if they have metals in them they'll start to rust away to sort of iron oxide, uh, kind of like Golden Gate Bridge style. Um, uh, and basically, the long if they're there for a really long time, even the minerals, the like stable minerals like silicates will start to break down to clay and the thing will just eventually fall apart and it will be unrecognizable as a meteorite. Um, so the, we want to get it as quick as possible before it gets rained on to be the most pristine it can be. 
uh, some contamination is uh, unavoidable. Even, even in like some of the best curatorial facilities, we've seen some evidence of some alteration in certain phases over time, uh, which is again, like despite all best efforts and all current knowledge, stuff starts to react uh, yeah. in these systems. But you can still get a lot, a lot of really important science out of them in terms of origin of our solar system, origin of the planet. Well, David Dagan has come up with a, a little a little bit of news for you. He says, I have a few fragments of the Chelyabinsk asteroid, asteroid if you want to see them. So there you go. Always more than happy to see <laughs> see bits of meteorite, bits of space rock. So yeah, maybe once uh, once we're allowed to see each other again and we're out of tier four lockdown, we should catch up. I'd, I'd love to see that. I think Similarly, that's Robert, I'd love, to, I'd love to see Strathmore in the flesh. <laughs> There you go, there's an offer. Now, well, I, I think, and I may be wrong, but I think that we've exhausted the questions. Um, so I, I, what I will do is if there's no one else worth anything on the chat, chat box, I'll close the meeting. And yeah. <laughs> look, thank you very much for a wonderful a wonderful lecture. Um, I, I wish I could see it on a bigger screen. The 14 inch loses <laughs> some of the details, but that's my problem, not yours. And I would certainly hope that David would take a mental note to have you back in March around about that time frame. Uh, certainly in a new session next year, starting in September. And if you're still around, you're not in Australia, I hope nobbing it in the back, uh, in, the, in the bush, we'll, we'll have you back again. So oh, that'd be lovely. That, I just want to thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thank care. you very much. That's great. Okay. great. Okay. I'll, I often say at this time, safe home, but everyone is home, so <laughs> go and make a cup of tea. You've earned it. <laughs>